surfacing from sleep to the plane's soporific rumble, Ben looked out the window to his right and saw what he knew from past flights to be Labrador, brown, treeless, tundra and low mountains, the first land he had seen since they had left Europe behind without landing there many hours ago. Toronto would be about an hour away. He shifted in his seat, and a pressure and abrasion let him know that he was erect, his tumescence straining painfully against the seatbelt that had still been required at the time he had drifted off, shortly after a frightening moment of turbulence. He glanced at Chandrika in the next seat and found her asleep, mouth open, snoring slightly, with head tipped back and resting on the shoulder of Manoj, also asleep, also visibly hard under her lightly clutching hand. Someone had farted, richly, probably both of them. Chandrika's video screen writhed and flashed with the sounds of screams and carnage of what appeared to be a Japanese zombie movie. Looking across the aisle, his eyes immediately met the mesmerized, predatory stare of a teenage girl, Indian like most of the passengers on this direct 14-hour flight from Mumbai. He turned back to his own space, the turned-off video screen, the laptop, unread in-flight literature, and unopened between-meal snacks in the pouch on the back of the seat ahead of him. A couple of seats ahead, two stewardesses were working their way down the aisle, one on either side of a cart loaded with beverages. Ben sniffed, concerned that the fart, simple or compound, would be misattributed to him, and was relieved to find that it had almost completely dissipated. As the first stewardess's perfect lateral curve backed into view, he caught sight of Sumit standing in the aisle on the other side of the cart, towards the front, waiting. Sumit saw him see and smiled. This would probably be his last visit from business class up front, where he and Ankit were sitting. Would you like anything to drink? The stewardess asked him, and he caught a fleeting spasm of surprised recognition in her ravishing young face. Yes, please, he answered in Hindi, a little embarrassed at his own ostentatiousness, but unable to restrain himself. Black coffee for me and for my sleeping friends here, coffee with cream and sugar, one each. Showing less surprise at his choice of language, clearly it was not news to her, she answered cheerfully in the same, but started and nearly mispoured the coffee when Chandrika emitted a strongly whiskey-flavored gunshot-like belch as she shifted her position, refreshing her hold on Manoja's crotch. The cart passed on, the second stewardess smiling a little furtively at Ben and glancing at Chandrika with a mixture of fascination and horror. And then Sumit was standing there. Hey, man, he said, laying his left forearm on the top of the seat in front of Manoj. How are things back here in cattle car class? Just the way I like them, said Ben. I have actually flown in business class once, before I became a big rock star. Not my style. Everyone gets his own Captain Kirk command throne, right, with all the gadgets? Yeah, said Sumit, it's not really my style either, but you know, Ankit likes it, and he thought that for my first international plane trip... Next time you can sit with us, Ben said. Next time I'll sit with you and Sudeshna, said Sumit. Yes, said Ben, you probably will. There was an electronic ping, and the captain's voice came on the intercom, Hindi first, as usual. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now beginning our descent to Toronto. Chandrika stirred. Stick close to me once we leave the plane, said Ben to Sumit with ironic seriousness. It'll look pretty tame out there, but believe me, beneath the surface, it's crazier than you can imagine. Sumit laughed broadly. We'll all bow to your superior experience. Even Ankit will be in the jungle. All he knows is L.A. and San Diego, those dull little towns. Chandrika stirred again, moaned, and opened her eyes. Holy shit, it's Sumit, she wheezed. I thought I was sitting with Ben. Oh, there you are. Did I fart a lot? Are we there yet? We'll be landing in about an hour, said Ben. The announcement just came on. Are you still sure you don't want to sit by the window? God, no, she said. I piss myself. Maybe on the way back. Manoj, baby, did you sleep well? Manoj stretched in his seat, looked around, and nodded, yawning. I got coffee for both of you just before you woke up, said Ben, gesturing at the cups on his little seat-back table. No more whiskey for you, young lady. We'll be in the airport by the time the coffee's gone through you. Smirking, she lowered her and Manoj's tables and took their cups. How's Ankit? she asked Sumit, raising hers and sniffing it. Totally at home, he said, with the suggestion of a smirk, frequent flyer. 
That Captain Kirk chair would be kind of cool, she said, taking a sip, with the poshness of the scene up there. You know, it's not my style, and it looked like you can't sit together, you know? She caressed Minocha's hand. Then to Ben, where are we at this point, Captain? What can we see? He looked out the window at what was by now a sea of dark green. It's northern Quebec, he said, the French province. Forests, small lakes. Soon we'll begin to see the occasional little town. I know the route. It'll take us past the town where I grew up, actually, in northeastern Ontario. Not far to the south of it, though we won't be able to see it. She leaned over his lap and peered out the window with comical dread. Oh my God, she whispered. Manoj, you gotta see this. Manoj raised himself and moved forward so that they were both suspended over Ben with their foreheads pressed side by side against the glass and her hanging breasts almost brushing Ben's lips. Hey, she said suddenly, I have to take a shit before we land. Better go now, said Ben. Yeah, she said, cause I'll be fucked if I'm gonna hold it one way or the other. So better put it where it's not gonna get us into trouble. Still leaning against the top of, his, of the seat, Sumit was silently struggling to contain a fit of hilarity. There were a few scandalized murmurs from the faceless people in the seats ahead of them. Chandrika and Manoj retreated from the window, laboriously extracted themselves from the narrow gap of their sitting space, and proceeded up the aisle with Sumit, all three stepping with comical tentativeness, as if on the deck of a storm-tossed ship. Ben watched until Chandrika and Manoj stumbled into the washroom together, no doubt again to the scandal of those who saw them. Then he slipped his laptop out of the seat, pocket in front of him. As he was waiting for it to warm up, he looked out the window again, just in time to see what he knew to be the southernmost narrowing of Lake Temiskaming, where it begins, somewhere around there, to be called the Ottawa River. Lake Temiskaming, at whose northern head stood the town where he had grown up, where his father still lived in the same house, where he and Sudeshna had visited him after every one or two of their sad years together, until the last time, some three years ago now. Would they ever go back? Out of the primordial darkness of the screen appeared his current screensaver, a picture he had taken from the dilapidated wooden dock at the tip of the peninsula that divided the lakehead into two large bays. Looking south, one saw, beyond the picture's troubled water, a crowded vista of receding hills and islands, Quebec on the left, Ontario on the right, under a sky of tumultuous gathering storm clouds. A new email from his father asked him, with an innocent pathos that wrenched his heart, if he planned to visit during this trip, and it was implicitly clear that he thought, naturally, that Sudeshna must be with him. And of course, he would visit his father. And of course, it would not be with Sudeshna. He was able to open Sudeshna's email without fear, and it was such that he almost forwarded it to his father in place of his own reply. Dakshu, as you know, this morning I begin my new job at the academy. I don't have to tell you how important it is to have work, to be making money for giving something to people. I was not expecting to be pr troubled by this, the fact that on the morning of this first day you would not be here as I leave the house, but flying to Toronto for the first time without me. I thought I wouldn't care, that I would, if anything, be glad. I even fantasized about getting your email, telling me that you would never come back, that you had finally found the strength to make this decision that we have both longed to be able to make, or for fate to make, since we couldn't. And now that fate, with some help from us, has brought us to this position where the decision could so easily be made, I am, after all, feeling sad that I'm not there with you, because I can see from here the very minute when you are going to land, that I'm not there sitting beside you as the plane hits the runway and the whole plane shakes and roars, a moment when we both used to be afraid and hold hands so that we would die together. We will be there again at that moment. We will hold hands again. I know that now. <laughs>